So I've got some glare on my computer, but you can see how different these three copies of the painting Breakfast in Bed by Mary Cassatt are. Um, so I'm, I'm going to decide which one I'm going to use. I think that's important to, to compare them all side by side. You can see that this one is a lot pinker or peachier colored um, and soft. This one has a lot of dark green tones, and this is what I based my uh, my tone, my green gray tone on, although I see it in a much grayer version in this one. This one has more yellow in it. This one has a lot more yellow and orange in it. You can see the yellow tones throughout. So you just need to make a, um, a decision on which one you like. So this one feels a little too dark to me. At first glance, I like this one more because I'm, uh, I typically like a, a more dramatic, contrasty painting, but I'm looking at the darks in here and they're almost black. Uh, this one feels too light to me. There's not enough color in it. And this one, it feels like kind of a good medium tone between the two. So it doesn't really matter for drawing. I'm going to do a rough draft first, but I wanted to make a decision here on the front end with which reference photo I plan to use. So I'm also going to take this into, it is in my preview app. I'm going to make it as large as I can right now. And I'm going to grayscale it. Remember, you, if you're using preview as your photo editor, you just click on the little marker, click on the little mountains, and then you take all the saturation out. Whatever you're using, just uh, Google it and find out how to adjust saturation in that photo viewer. Uh, so that just takes all the color out of the way. Let's go ahead and do that with this uh, darker version and compare the two, although I already closed it out. For the Mary Cassatt painting, I have mixed up a green-gray background or green-gray tone, just using whatever colors I had. I pulled out black and yellow with a little bit of a, a cerulean type turquoise blue and I'm trying to get a middle tone or middle to light tone. I mix these three colors. This is my Zinser to prime my sketchbook page with and then this is the uh, the mixture with the Zinser added to it. So I'm going to go ahead and prime the page with this first. So uh, the first coat almost dried as soon as I put my brush to the paper, the paper is so absorbent, which is why I like to put a uh, prime on there. You, I mixed another pile of this color, and you can see you can tweak it to make it more yellow or more bluish, um, just to suit whatever you see in front of you. This one is a little bit yellower, so I'm gonna put a second coat on as well. All right, for your rough draft, uh, just a couple of things to, to remember. She is three heads tall, all the way down to this bottom heel, and the composition is three heads wide of the, of the two figures. So that's really all I'm going to determine as I do this quick rough draft. I must squint my eyes as I do this, just um, thinking only of simple shapes. Simple shapes. And this overall shape is straight down, over, down, and there's a diagonal here. So that would help to do a, just a, a cocoon before you get started. Her head is a little larger than the baby's head. And, and just kind of noting these diagonals, they kind of lead your eye around.
So I can see, <clears throat> once I put that halfway mark in there, I can see how close her chin is to the halfway mark. It's way down here. So these are the darkest darks. And you could go ahead and record those. And then these are all middle tones. So if you wanted to, do, if you were using paint, you could just do a quick rough draft and mask these in just to get your values worked out and your simple shapes. Not worrying so much about accuracy, but just getting your, the simplest form of this down. This is just on a scrap piece of paper so that I can get a little bit more familiar with the subject. You can see the negative space when you draw that half, halfway mark in here. You can see that the hand dips down a little below that. One head, two heads. Three. One hand, two hand. Oh no, three. It's out here. Okay. So the main purpose of doing a rough draft like this is to divide. Um, Capture the overall design with any zigzags, uh, any interesting shapes, um, just to kind of get the main shapes, but also to divide it into values. So we have the darks, the middle tones, and the lights. So this painting is basically three values, predominantly light. The second is middle tone, and the third least uh, combination of values is darks. So that helps you um, from the beginning also to make the cocoon and just decide how many heads tall, how many heads wide, where's my halfway mark, and that helped me keep the figure in proportion so that I didn't end up with the arms all the way down here, which happens quite often. Try to get yourself in the habit of doing that every time. It makes so such a big difference to to do a quick rough draft also the reminder to get all the features in one third of her face and in a little less than one half of her face and that's a, a good thing to remember as you get started all right you can see how much darker from the beginning this one is let's see what happens when we take all the so see the values are much um, sharper and more contrasty. Again, the darkest darks are almost pure black. And you just don't see pure black, in, especially in baby skin tones. So I, I believe I'm going to stick with this one as well. You may be able to use this one as you're drawing. It may help you see um, edges more. All right, so I've created three equal head lengths for this baby I'm going to use. This is the most obvious measurement to me is the baby's head. And I have made three that are equal in length. And I'm going to see how many heads tall she is first. So she is two. And if we go all the way to the end of where her feet go, right here, she's three heads tall. You can easily see she's one, two, and a half heads. Exactly, these little green dots are the halfway mark to her, the back of her knee where her knee bends. And then if you go all the way to the foot. So I can um, make a little notation of that, three heads tall. And then I can take this measurement and see how many heads wide she is. Here to here and here to here are the same. So the center point, let's see where the center is on this one. 
a little bit lower, right there. <coughs> the very center of her, her head height to width is right here on her temple. So that's a good note to make. Okay, I have made a, a, a bit of a game to um, find as many circles as I can on this child. Well, and the mother as well. Uh, there's, it, it may be a little hard pressed on some of them to, to call it a circle, but it's pretty, um, it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of circles in babies. And it just helps my drawing to see these big areas that are full and round, almost like a sphere. I'm not sure why it's labeling these C and CV, so just disregard that. But you can see the feet, the heels. If you go back over here and look on this other image, you can see these circles where I've, where I've drawn them. Uh, even on her arm right here, you can see a fullness of the pad of the muscle right here as it goes near the elbow. Uh, the babies, that same area on the baby. The hand, you can kind of see how it compares to a circle. This hand is a series of overlapping circles. You can see a circle here, another overlapping circle here. Usually a foreshortened arm is a series of circles, or foot, or leg, rather. Uh, the curls and the hair create circles. I can zoom in and you can find a ton of circles on her face, her nose, each nostril, the whole um, mouth area, the chin is a circle. Each of the cheeks is a circle. So um, make it, and you can see the sleeve is a circle. You can see some things on the pillows. You can see this sleeve on the mother's arm is another circle. Uh, all, each of the knuckles can be drawn in as a circle so that as you shade, you're mindful of those round shapes. Uh, the, fa the mother's face also, the sockets, the tip of the nose, the nostrils, the lips. We saw that in our last lesson. Two circles for the lower lip, three, well, two oblongs for the upper lip, plus a little cupid's bow in the middle. A circle for her chin, circle for the cheeks, circle for the earlobe. So train yourself. If this helps you, if it doesn't, don't worry about it. If it makes it confusing, but train yourself to see circles. The way this arm wraps around, you can see a series of overlapping circles in the sleeves. And just train yourself to try to see those because it'll help with your drawing. So you have two circles on this, the baby's, the baby's arm, uh, and then this little triangular shape at the top. You can also see a circle here on this part of her arm. So I'm going to be thinking about that as I draw this together, not only the, the head lengths, and the tilt, but also where I can find circles and the plumb lines. Now, you see, um, I measured the heads kind of at an angle just because I started with this head at an angle, the highest place to the lowest place. So, you know, I could change that and come over here and make it straight if I wanna do everything straight. Just remember, it's gonna be about the same if you do it that way, one head, two heads to the bottom of her arm, and three heads almost to the bottom of the heel. Okay, so I have created one, two, three, four, five, six equal lines. All six lines are a head length for this baby. This is the head width. These are all equal. I, I want to show you just how many of those relative sizes are in this painting. Um, from her toe to her heel is a head length. From her uh, fingers to her elbow is a head length. From her sleeve to her first knuckle on her pinky is a head length. Um, from, let's see, there's probably a few more if we just look. Uh, the, the thing to remember is find uh, a length that seems right to you, that seems obvious, and use that to your advantage. Now, how many heads tall is the mother? So one, two to her arm, a little over two and a half to the bottom of the baby's, where the baby sits, her thigh. 
and how many head widths is the whole composition. So she's exactly, I'm keeping this on my, on my uh, stick, she's exactly one head here, right through her, her part, a little less than a head here, so it just goes up into her part just a little bit. So one, two to the end of the baby, another easy measurement, and almost three heads all the way to the end of the painting. So we've got three heads this way, three heads this way. I have also determined the tilt of the head. And when I put this measurement in, I went straight through the lips, the nose, the glabella, up to the part to get the tilt of her head. You see that her all of her face is in half, almost half. It's in the lower side, the lower half of the head. So you'll need to remember that. And you can see on the baby that all of her face is in the third. So from, let's say, here to here, here to here, and there to there. So those are just a few things to remember. Uh, we'll use plumb lines when we start adding in things like the table, the toe, you can see what that inter intersects with. I'll, I'll use straight plumb lines. The baby, again, the baby's head is at a tilt this way. The mother's head is at a tilt this way. So it's going to be important to get those tilts defined. Again, that, that took me about five minutes just because I was drawing and videoing. But it should take you three to five minutes to, to make some decisions. Okay, also I need to decide. This, this image here is cropped and you don't see the arm, her, the mother's arm, the left side, and the coffee cup is cropped kind of at a bad spot right here on a tangent. This is the one I'm using, and you see the whole arm all the way out to her sleeve and uh, just to the right of the coffee cup. So that's probably the one I need to use. And I'm going to keep the circle so that I'm mindful of those. But I'm just going to use a black and white image to do a quick rough draft. Um, my canvas is, um, I'm, I'm doing it long uh, landscape wise. So that is a consideration. Uh, this original painting was 23 by 28, I believe. So that is a consideration when you're deciding whether to do it portrait or landscape. Um, so I'm going to decide, uh, going back to my measurements, she is three heads tall to the bottom of her heel, so I need to divide my canvas. This is top of head. I'm going to leave a little bit of room above the top of her head. This is bottom of feet. So I need to make three heads fit here. One, two, no, a little bit bigger. One, two, three. All right. So that's the size of her head, and that's going to be my relative length. So see, you only put one line at the top, one line at the bottom, and then divide that into thirds. Also, I know that the whole composition is one, two, three, a little more than four heads wide. So let's just say one, two, three, four. So it looks like I can fit the whole thing right in here without any problem. I just want to make sure before I spend a lot of time drawing that I can fit it all in this. It's going to be small. It's going to be, again, like doing a head that's the size of a quarter. So I'm going to mass map out a few more things. I know that her height and width are about the same. So, and let's see if I'm figuring out heads wide. Let me go ahead. Here's a head length, so one to the handle of the coffee cup, two 
to the mom's chin, three to just inside her arm. So one to the edge of the coffee cup. There's the handle. Two to the mom's chin. So mom's chin is somewhere in here. So again, it's tricky making two figures fit together so that you don't have them too far apart or too close together. So let me get, again, let me check and see from this side. Here's a head length. And so one head length to the baby's arm and the side of her hair. So let me go back this way. So one head length to the baby's side of the baby's head. So the baby's head's gonna need to be in this area. Your brain just wants to stick it kind of in the middle or, or over to the side of the middle. So that's the baby's head right there. Let me go ahead. And then here's the mother's head, which is larger than the baby's head. And lower, comes down around the, the wrist. And there's a little space in between the mother's head and the baby's head. This shape of the baby's um, torso, uh, the shoulders intersect through the face like this. And it's kind of a big circle. Uh, one second head comes down to the mother's arm. So this is the mother's arm, the bottom almost of the mother's arm. And then the baby's leg would be here where the next third head starts. That circle comes down just below the chin. So we know that the circle of that knee is gonna be back here. That's gonna be tricky because um, if you get the leg too far this way or too far that way, so again, this is just for mapping purposes, and you can see how these circles kind of line up. All right, I want to stay true to this because this makes all the difference. So the bottom of the second head is where her arm is. Her arm dips down <clears throat> just a little below that. And then the leg is about halfway down here. One, two, three heads, one head, one head up to the, to the part, just above the part. All right, I know that looks crazy. I'm not going to do any details at this point. Everything in me wants to. What's that angle? Match your angles. If you're working from life, you just hold your paintbrush or whatever you're using to draw with up. Let me go ahead and erase this because I've got a lot of stuff going on right here. The wrist comes just below the elbow here. Starts to turn direction. you got that big circle, which is just about right of her hand. Her hand is really long. I would say her hand is almost a head length, almost, if, you, if the finger were extended. So from the wrist out, I have to go over here and get a head length a little bit shorter than that. And so, so see, that gives me about the right amount of space over here. Circle here. Hand goes up. I'll come back and put that in in a bit. Then her hand, this hand, comes right along the back of her. And we can see how big that hand is. The longest finger, I'm going to say, is about half. Yep, half of one of those. Half of her head. So let's go ahead and find the halfway mark here.
and then her eyebrows are higher from eyebrows to nose and nose to chin is the halfway mark so I've eyeballed about where her eyebrows go and then we're going to divide this in half for her features bottom of nose would be about right there all over in this segment of her face okay just above her brows all right so the foot would be right along in here can't go any further than this and no lower than this so I got to make all that fit right in here top of this foot comes right through the arm here and remember this was a head head length from heel to toe both feet oh wow oh no that's not right then so head width heel to toe and then toe to bottom of nose that's got to be divided in half well yeah I guess it is so there top of the toe toe to the bottom of the nose so the toe comes all the way up here that second foot or the, the back foot is right in here and then there's another foot underneath there gosh I know this sounds so confusing but <clears throat> there's a lot to line up here so again you can just draw it if you like and we can go back and check it with these these tools there's another little circle here and I've figured out where the cuff goes right along through her wrist, right up through her face. Maybe even further over this way. Here's the knee. Here's the other little kneecap. Very foreshortened right there. So usually on babies, the halfway mark is the eyebrows. Sometimes, it just depends on the tilt of the head, but you can double check that. You go from the highest place. Uh, I'm gonna go right straight over her eyebrow, not quite the highest place on the head, because that's the halfway mark. And remembering that the features of this baby are all in one third of the head. The foot is large. Usually the foot is the size of the face and it is a little bigger. So there may be some foreshortening going on there. See, I don't have it, I don't have it large enough. The foot comes parallel with the arm. So yeah, it is a bit higher. So once I have this straight line of the table, I can see how much negative space there is between the heel. And I can tell I have that off. So there needs to be about that much negative space. All right, since I took my rough draft so far and for time, uh, for the sake of time, I've just got a piece of tracing paper and I'm gonna trace over my drawing and just get I'm gonna look at what I'm doing I'm just gonna get the gist of this drawing down the main parts right here's the halfway mark so see how I already wanted to put the eyes right in the center and they're over here
And that's really enough. I just wanted to transfer the, the basic things. And it's funny how if you put those features smack dab in the middle, it's going to just distract you throughout. You're going to want to, your brain's going to want to continue putting those back in the middle. So determine when there's a three-quarter view on a face, determine where the halfway point is, and that'll help you every time. So reminder, the halfway point is right on the edge of her iris and on the baby. It's a third to the iris, a third to the ear, and a third to the back of the hair. All right, so I've used um, charcoal powder and a soft brush, just a little soft watercolor mop type brush to apply charcoal to the back of this tracing paper. And I just tapped the excess off back into the charcoal. You can also use vine charcoal and just color over the back uh, to just create transfer paper. Then I'm gonna use a clip. and This way I can kind of position it where I want to on the page. Um, I, do, I am careful with it because it'll smear and kind of make a mess. But I think I'm gonna put it about right there and clip it to the, to the sketchbook so that it's not moving. Be careful with transferring. Um, I'm transferring my drawing, so something different happens when you sketch it yourself. It becomes very mechanical when you just try to trace things. You have to know how to draw. You cannot trace and rely on that to create a good painting. Every stroke, every time the brush hits the canvas, you're drawing, so you cannot skip the drawing stage. Harley Brown mentions that if you want to trace to use just lines of demarcation as to where the top of the head, the bottom of the head, maybe the hand, the elbow, and then go back in and trace them together. Um, but I would recommend that you always, that you continue learning to measure and use plumb lines. That way when you're working from life, you cannot trace. So you, can, you always have a way to uh, correct yourself. So I'm using a regular graphite pencil that has sort of a, a dull tip just so that I don't bend the paper. And I'm just gonna quickly transfer some of these lines, just as I mentioned. If you wanna use a different color pencil so that you can tell where you've been, that's helpful as well. Now her head, I have the tilt wrong on her head. I have it too tilted. So I wanna be mindful of that as I come over here and correct. Cause that has her looking back, tilting her head a little bit further back than it really is. So be mindful of that. Any, any uh, corrections that you can see as you're, don't just trace it, continue looking at your reference. That way you're checking yourself the whole time. And remember these circles that we put in initially, that babies are just a series of circles. This is her other hand, and just make up the pad of the hand. Don't think about fingers at this stage because we're going to block in this drawing with paint. So you'll also note that I'm transferring my, my mistakes on here as well. Make sure you attach it with tape or, or a clip so that you're not constantly moving. And if it helps you go back in and put the circles back in. But watch the tilt, because again, I have this arm. Look how I have this arm of the baby going this way. Everything's kind of lunging forward and it actually goes down through her thigh right here. And see how simply putting the features where they go, even though there's no drawing there yet, you can start to see a likeness. Is if they're in the right place, that has everything to do with getting a lot. 
mixing color for Mary Cassatt's Breakfast in Bed. Uh, I have my primaries, which, which is what we've used for this all these Impressionist studies. Well, all the studies we've done this year to try to learn more about color. I have two yellows uh, this time. This is a CAD yellow light. This one's a little bit greener. This one's a, this is cooler. This is warmer. So what I'm really looking for is something in between the two. Uh, my reds. This is a, more of a CAD red medium, but it leans to the to the uh, light side a little bit. But I'm looking for just a fire engine red and then ultramarine blue. So really just the three colors. I have some left over from the last couple of paintings, uh, yellow, red, and blue. Let me go ahead, I keep a paper towel in my hand all the time when I'm painting, just, or especially when I'm mixing color. I'm gonna go ahead and mix. You can see how that leans toward the orange side a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and just make a middle tone yellow, a, a neither warm nor cool yellow, but just a, a flat yellow. Oh, got a little bit of red in there. So that's pretty close to the three primaries, and that's what we're gonna be working with today. I like to use a small palette knife. Um, I have several. This one is got a little bit too pointy of an edge to, to it, but it's small. So I like the smaller palette knives because I can make smaller piles of color. I'm going to go ahead and mix up the area that is the largest on the painting, which is the clothing colors. There won't be any pure white unless we're just working wet into wet and we can't get a color to register. So I will be um, mixing the darker colors that I see in the pillows and the sheets, which are pretty much cool, which is nice. It makes the skin tones really pop and sing of blue and white, ultramarine blue and white. It's left over from the last painting, and that's all that's in it is blue and white. If I want to gray a color down, typically I'm going to use the complement, which is orange. Uh, in this case, I do see some warm tones in the sheets and the pillows. Let me zoom in a little bit so that we can really see what's going on. I see warms and cools in the whites. So I'm going to make, I'm going to leave this because I do see this in here. I see some, a darker version of ultramarine as well. Now, when you just mix ultramarine by itself with a little bit of white, it's very, very bright. So again, I'm going back to the complement. I'm gonna mix up some orange and I don't need that much red for orange. Just gradually add your, your red in because it's such a powerful color. So there's my orange, and I see that in her cheeks, the baby's cheeks, the feet. I see that a lot, so I'm gonna mix a pretty good pile of orange here. Okay, I'll try to keep my warm colors on this side and my cool colors on this side. So I'm gonna take a little bit of that orange, bring it over here with the blue, just to do, you have to be careful. If you have too much yellow in your orange mixture, it's gonna go greenish. So when it starts to do that, it feels weird to you. Just grab a little bit of your red. That'll warm it back up again so it doesn't go too green. And that just gives us a, a duller blue that's not so chromatic and vibrant. I see that in the tabletop maybe as a nice dark. If you mix a little white with it, and I'm using titanium white, but it's a Georgian brand, so it's very, very creamy. I'm not sure how this is gonna work. I've been used to using a very thick titanium white. Um, this is gonna make all my colors pretty loose. So see, that blue and orange makes a, a duller version. So you can compare the two. This is blue with orange mixed and then pull down with white, and this is just ultramarine blue by itself. Pillowcases, and again, look at the size of your canvas, and I'm just doing a nine by 12, so I don't have a large canvas to cover, but I, I will need enough of this color to, to cover that background. So let's, let's make a couple of piles. And it, it feels purplish to me, so I'm gonna go ahead and mix a little red in with this ultramarine blue here. 
just to lean it towards the purple side or a periwinkle blue. You can see the difference, and this is a brighter hue. This complement always grays it down. So sometimes having those side by side will give you an idea of uh, which you prefer. And you can make your decision based on this little color mixing se segment. Tone, a green gray tone. If I put just a little bit more yellow in it, it'll go to the green side. Yeah, that's close to what I see. All right, is the, the question, is that enough paint? Yeah, I see this color along the, the headboard and in the little side table. And I definitely see this purple throughout the rest of the painting. All right, let's mix up a little bit of hair color, which is gonna be, hers is gonna be um, like a burnt umber color. You can squeeze out burnt umber if you'd rather just um, have that mixed up or you can try to make a brown. Brown, typically I start off with red and green. Um, red and green is my kind of go-to for browns. So I'm gonna make a green to start with. And I wanna not put too much yellow because it will lighten my brown. Now let's add some red to it. I'm gonna go with this darker middle tone red. Instead of mixing it in with the whole pile, I'm mixing it over to the side. And you can see I put too much red with it. Now what does it need? That's a brown, but it's kind of a, that was a purplish brown, that's a reddish brown. Okay, now we're getting closer to the child's hair. But it's getting lighter. So what do you do for your darkest brown in the hair? Well, your darkest color of these three is blue. So we can add more blue, which is really gonna cool it down. But I see that in the darkest dark on the baby's top of the baby's head. And ask yourself, is it warm or is it cool? If we really zoom in, you can see that it's pretty cool. So there you can see a purplish brown, a greenish brown, a reddish brown. Three browns. Do we see those anywhere? Well, I see this bluish brown in the top of the table, bedside table. I see this in the top of the mother's hair. And I see a mixture of these two in the top of the baby's hair. I really don't see this reddish color anywhere. So what do we do with the rest of that? Well, let's see what happens when we add more yellow. Again, I'm always learning about color. I typically mix raw sienna by, by mixing yellow and purple together. Let's see what happens if we just take this reddish brown or orangish brown and mix more yellow with it. Put a little bit up. Again, these are only just a mixture of three different colors. So we just keep tweaking them, see which way we go with it. There's a little bit more red in there. Yeah, let's see what happens with a little white. Do I see that anywhere? Mm, not really. So white's not the way to go. More yellow. So play around, just play around. This is, this is, this whole project is for your education, for my education, for us to learn how to mix these colors with the simplest palette. Mary Cassatt's palette. So we don't really know what colors she used. I've, I've done a little bit of research and I have not been able to find um, a palette, a leftover palette that would show her colors. Um, 
there is an image of the pastels that she used. But we know with pastels, it's, you know, it's a whole nother ball game. So uh, we're just gonna go with mixing the best that we can. So we've got some hair color, some possible hair color, some color for the tabletop, which leans a little on the blue side there. And now let's see, let's go ahead and do some skin tones. Uh, mother and child are very similar in their skin tones. I asked myself, is it, are they yellowish? Are they pinkish? Are they orangish? And they definitely have an overall orange tone to them. So I'll start, since I have this little pile, let me mix a bigger pile. All right, there's a, the deepest orange. I could probably mix a pretty deep orange and let's put some blue with it and see what happens. You'll get, eventually you'll get like a burnt sienna color, which my quick go-to palette that I got from Daniel Green included burnt sienna and yellow ochre and raw sienna. So, this is a more usable color in the shadows. Um, and then as you mix this with white, let's see what happens. I always like to mix at least two or three values of any given color. There's gonna be shadows under the chins and around the neck area, all over the arms and legs is gonna be shadow color. So let's go ahead and mix a bluer version of the orange. And I, wanna, I might even just brush mix some of this. The color that's around them is gonna bounce into their, their skin tones, this brighter purplish blue. Um, I also like to have a more yellow version. So let's mix up a bit more over here. It's all just a mixture of red and yellow with a speck of blue in it, or speck of purple in it, if you wanna think about it that way. Yellow and purple are the complements. Orange and blue are the complements. Red and green are the complements. So if there was a lot of red in an area, pink tones, then I would be adding green. But we're gonna stick with the blue and purple tones for this since it's orange. We're not gonna really be mixing it much green. Okay, so that's a place to start. All right, I redrew. I uh, divided the canvas, the original canvas in half, both ways, vertically and horizontally to check my drawing because she felt, the baby felt too compressed. Her head feels really huge. Uh, I think a lot of that is just the hair and I'll be able to fix that, but I, I have checked to see where my halfway marks are and I moved the legs up. They were way down here. Her leg was way down here. So before you get started, I would double check your drawing just because no amount of paint is gonna fix a bad drawing on here unless you know what you're doing, unless you're aware of your mistakes. I have my palette mixed up and I have chosen a handful of brushes, mostly filberts, small filberts since this is a nine by 12, some uh, rosemary mongoose brushes because I will get to a point where I'm working wet and wet and that's when I like to switch to those. But mostly like a number two filbert is gonna work good for this size painting. Use as large a brush as you can get away with, and we're gonna start off by just uh, massing in the darkest darks, and I will probably make a few notes for my lights. My, my whole canvas or my whole paper is a middle tone, so my lights will register as lights, my darks will register as darks, and the middle tone should be about the same value as the tone on the canvas. I've adjusted the height of my easel so that it's the same as my reference. If I were working from life, I would have, I would position my easel so that I could see the model. 
and uh, at the same time and flick my eye back and forth between the model and my canvas. So that's important. You don't want your easel too high or you're gonna have problems with your shoulders. So make sure you set yourself up with your pre-mix palette, your brushes out, your paper towels, and your canvas at the right height that's comfortable for you and that you can see your reference easily without having to, to turn your head very much. So I wanted to show you on the color wheel, the, you, the colors that she used are pretty much across from each other. So you have this green in between a blue green, a gray green across from this red orange. Uh, and you see that these are mixed with the complement here. And so that's pretty much a, a really harmonious palette. All right, so I'm putting in the darkest darks, and you can see uh, this is a medium to dark tone, so it's not really registering. But it's that blue, the blue-gray color, kind of a mixture of the two. And I'm gonna just put everywhere I think these darks are on the pillows. And I want to work fast today because I want to try to get as much of this covered as I can as a, a, a quick block in. So anywhere I even think I see these tones, I'm going to go ahead and, and put them in. And you see why your drawing is important because you, it's easy to, to um, not think about drawing when you're doing this, but to just to be thinking about color and value. So if you've got a drawing that's pretty close to the right, um, it's pretty close to being accurate, then you're not gonna have to think so much as you're drawing, but you can kind of go by your drawing as your guide. And I'm seeing that bluish tone, whoops, um, all around the perimeter of their bodies. So you can just mask, go ahead and mask that in, just make sure it's dark enough. I'm mixing a little bit more of the red tone in to get it dark enough. And other than the hair, that's the darkest thing on the, the bodies is these areas of shadow. If your paint feels really stiff, uh, you just try to think of your brush as a spoon and scoop up more paint so that you can um, have enough on here to start moving it around. Think in simple shapes right now and just mass in the simple shapes as you see them. As it moves down the head here, it warms up. This feels cooler at the top. It gets a little warmer as it close, gets close to the hair color. Simple triangles or squares or circles or whatever, whatever abstract shape you can see or even think you see. Think about the skull and how a baby's head is, usually baby's heads are really large. So I may have overshot that a little bit, but you see how it comes out the back right here. You can see the roundness of the back of that skull. So there's the darkest dark on the painting. Other than their eyes and maybe this shadow around the coffee cup and on the top of the table, there's nothing else that's that dark. But while I have dark on my brush, I'm gonna go ahead and put the darks, all the darks in. And you can reserve this brush and use it only for darks. That way you don't risk contaminating your, your pure darks. My paint's already kind of sticky. So it goes on real different when it's sticky like that. If you've bought a cheap canvas, usually your, your surface is gonna be real absorbent because they prime those canvases with calcium carbonate usually, just ac acrylic gesso, and it's very absorbent. So as soon as you lay a stroke down, it sucks right into the 
to the canvas and it won't hardly move around for you. So that's why I like to put a prime, a tone on here to close up some of that porosity in the canvas. I guess that's the word. Anywhere you think you see these darks. And you can overlap, make them larger than they really need to be. Then when you come back in, you can, you can carve them back down. Remember the rhythms, like as you come around this shoulder, see how it intersects the face to make sure you're, you're, you're correcting your drawing as you go with this. Okay, I'm gonna move to the, to the um, middle tone. I'm gonna go ahead and do the bed and the pillows because they're behind the figures. So I'd like to go ahead and get those on first. So I'm moving to a middle tone. I've got a larger brush for this because it's a larger area. I don't wanna work myself to death. And it's a uh, hog hair, it's pretty aggressive. So this first layer you wanna be able to scrub with and put the masked areas in really boldly. And they're pretty much the, almost the same color as this tone. So they're not gonna register very much for you. Just ask yourself if it's greener in areas, purplish or blue, and just mass in these big shapes quickly. Resist the urge to paint anything white right now because there's nothing on here that's pure white. But your brain is gonna read her shirt and these pillows as white. There's also some warm areas <clears throat> down here. It almost looks like her underpainting may be warm. So again, we're still just trying to figure out the procedures that some of these artists used and it's not very clear. If we could see the edge of the canvas, you might be able to tell by the, the drips on the side what they used as a tone. or if they scumbled areas, sometimes you can see what's underneath an area. A lot of times artists use warm tones underneath, or Kinsler used cool, like cerulean blue and raw sienna color mixed because he did so many portraits. The cool tone would glow up through the skin tones and they, it created nice contrast. The, the range I can look at this uh, pillow next to that white dress and I can get, get a better idea of, you can see that this coffee cup is cool, but I can get a better idea of whether my values are right at this stage. I can also go ahead and put a few notes since I have some skin tone mixed up, I can put a few um, skin tone notes on here as well. And see on my palette, that's really dark, but when I get up here, it's fairly light. And it's got more red in it than I have mixed. As the mother's cheeks do. See how as you begin to paint, you're gonna to totally cover all your drawing lines. So if you don't know how to draw, you're gonna really struggle with this. I see that on her foot. All right, so at this point I have uh, my brush for the darks that I've used already and cleaned it off. Here's the flesh tones and here's the background color, the pillows. So I've got three different brushes. It's helping to keep my brushwork clean and not muddied. Sometimes your um, the the way your strokes go help will help with the, the dimensional effect, and um, these strokes are going from left to right on the bottom. That kind of helps pull that section down. A horizontal stroke will lay a surface down as if it's the top of a step or the top of a shelf, and a vertical stroke will stand it up and make it look like a wall. So you can think about the way you're laying your strokes on. All 
Okay, I kind of masked all this in. I'm gonna go ahead and start putting in some skin tones and I'm gonna use these, this uh, orange and blue pile to put some of these shadow tones in first. If you can stand this blotchy stage, it's uh, not gratifying to get all this laid on, but you can't really get anywhere until you get something on the canvas. So just start working the puzzle. And part of painting is learning to be okay with whatever stage you're in and having the hope that it'll get better as you keep working. And it's easy, uh, I keep going to the lightest lights. Our, our brain always wants to record the lights first. Typically those are the last things that you put on. So be aware of the tendency to do that. You see how the charcoal just melts into the paint? It's not really a hindrance. So this color between orange, the orange that I mixed up with this just tiny speck of blue in it is working really well as an overall skin tone. And then we can go back in there and add some lights later. You can easily look <clears throat> at what's around to see what colors would be bouncing in. So the blue on this would be bouncing into her blouse, blue, blue tones into the hand, blue tones into the, the shadow colors into the, to the top of the leg. And maybe the skin affects the white sheet as well. So maybe there's some warmth bouncing off the skin into the, to the bed sheets. You can see a little bit down here under her fingers. <clears throat> it will be interesting to know whether she painted from life these types of scenes where there are babies. I, I can't imagine that she could get a baby to sit still that long. It's real easy to misjudge value, but having this middle tone background makes it a little bit easier because this is a middle tone. The arms are middle tone the skin tones for the most part. And don't think about separating fingers or anything at this point. Just paint the hands as if they were a pad, uh, as if they were one unit, the fingers. Don't worry about fingernails or dividing the fingers up. Just look at the overall shape and mass it in. Squint your eyes often so that you can see uh, squinting here so you can see this the pad of the hand and the fingers are another value the top of the pad of the hand is one value and then the side plane where the pinky is is another value top of the arm is one value here bottom of the arm and then the 
part of her arm that's facing us is another value. I think in planes, the top plane of this arm is going to catch more light than the underside. In fact, if you just want to jump around and hit all the top planes first, you can kind of keep that straight in your mind. I'm just trying to establish um, a range of values right now. I'm not too worried about brushwork, but you can go ahead and put the brush strokes in in a more effective way right now instead of just throwing them on anyway. Ask yourself if it's warm or if it's cool. So here's her little blouse under this arm, which is an important separation right here. And her shirt is warmer than the mother's shirt. It has more of a, a yellowish tone to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in so I can keep track of where I am here. And it's easy to use these little pieces like negative space. They'll help with accuracy on your drawing. So simplify and keep all these big shapes pretty simple at this stage. So you're not, and especially working really small like this, it's really hard to get any detail. So use the right size brush for the job and then try not to get too many details in right now. You can see the underside of the mother's nose and the underside of her chin. And also think about these features wrapping around the head as if a bucket were over her head. The features would wrap around uh, in an arch. If she were looking down, they would wrap around in a U shape. Uh, the illustration um, is on the right. So you can see where she um, worked probably wet and wet with this because the, the sleeve has got some flesh tone mixed in it. This is an underplane right here. So remember that'll be shadowed and this top plane will be, will catch light. All right, I almost have the canvas covered. I want to try to get the hair covered. The um, secondary values on the hair. I'm going to just mask those in to start. Let me go ahead and start with the mom's hair. And I'm using this tone 
raw sienna type brown tone at the bottom. And when you're doing hair, always think about the way light hits the head. It's like a, wraps a halo almost around the head. And you'll have a light plane in the center. And right next to it, a darker plane. Uh, this is how Helen Van White paints onions. So she would put the light plane in the center and the two purple tones beside that light plane and then blend them together. So you're wrapping in both directions around the head. The hair grows this way and then the light hits it and you're wrapping it the opposite way. And at this stage, it can just be a blur. It doesn't have to be, that light can go back in there later. It doesn't have, you don't have to see any curls or brush or uh, hair strokes or anything. It could just be a soft blur. Now let's attend to some of these features on the face because that's pretty important. If I squint, it's a cool tone. The whole socket is pretty much in a cool tone. Same with the mother. It's a mid-tone cool. There's a little cool, cool tone under the lip. And there's definitely lots of cool under the mother's chin down along this side of her face. Remember that illustration uh, from the last session of a, a, a rainbow, the color values on the face, like kind of like a rainbow. You have ochre on the forehead, you have peach tones across the midsection of the face, and then you have a lot of cool tones in the lower section. Always um, consider that when you're putting these tones in you'll see more ochre on the forehead. It won't be solid strip, but you'll see more ochre tones. You'll see more warm tones through the midsection, ears, cheeks, nostrils. The skin is thin there and you'll see lots of warm tones in there. And if you'll prepare the socket, even though I drew those in with, with um, some detail, um, I like what Sargent used to say, or what he is famous for saying, that he prepared the socket like um, preparing the, the skull, and then he just dropped the eye in, sort of like a poached egg. But if you try to do the eye without thinking about the socket, you, you end up with a, a different... set of circumstances. You end up struggling to get the features in there right. And reminder, these are, if you're working on a sketchbook like this, this is little tiny head about the size of a quarter. Much more difficult to paint than a big large life-size head. Every little stroke matters and makes a difference. So if you have everything in the right place, <clears throat> even at this stage, you can start to see a little bit of a likeness, even though you don't have any features drawn. You just see shadow shapes on the face. And the paint's all wet now, so I can start to use a softer brush. This is the, the Series 279 Rosemary long flat mongoose brush and it is much better for working wet and wet. You're going to drive yourself crazy if you're trying to use a big hog hair brush right now. So I'm just going to put a warm tone in for the mouth right now. I'm not going to worry about Defining the lips. 
and a darker tone for under the nose. And pay attention to the angle. This nose, all the features wrap around the head. And she's, she's really not leaning back, but you do see this um, segment right here under the nose around the mouth. It's like a half of an orange. So don't paint that mouth and the bottom of that nose as if that were a flat surface. Think about it wrapping around the face. You're going to struggle if you paint all this as if it were flat. You have to think about the solid form of the head when you're painting. You can't, you have to translate it on a flat surface, but you have to think round. restating some of these darks that I've lost. And that's pretty easy to do when you go back in um, on your second session and, and rework some of this. Look at that dark eyebrow there. The mother's eyebrows are real distinctive. Eyebrows have everything to do with expression. So you put all these little dabs of light on pretty boldly, uh, and then you go back and kind of wiggle them in with a really light touch. The, pro the trick is not to totally take them all out, but you have to paint things, especially as small as this is, you have to paint things really and the overlapping method, uh, really paint them really strong. Colors really strong and the, the, sh the brush strokes big and then you come back in and carve them back down. Seems like her face is a little wider on this side. Her, the slant of her eyes is real distinctive. She's looking down and over at the baby so getting this stroke this way and this stroke this way is really important. Not so much that you do some kind of perfect iris in there. Or how, there's no highlight. There's a highlight on the baby's eyes, but it's more about the, uh, the angles that make the eyes turn. And I keep putting that pretty cheap color in and then I blend it right out, so. It's gonna have to go back in. And something's off here. I think I have our eyes too close together now. And a reminder that uh, if you've been sitting here painting for 45 minutes, you're probably getting that retinal fatigue. We're getting where you losing your objectivity. And I need to get up and look at it from a distance. Let me pop these lights in one more time. The computer time's off. That probably means it's time for a break. Okay, so I took a break, and this is not my favorite stage. This could be compared to when you're washing your hair and combing it all out, putting it in curlers, all the stuff you have to do. And then when you take your hair out of the curlers or rollers and you fix it, get your makeup on, put your earrings on, and you finally feel like you look a little bit more human. Uh, getting this paint on here 
and trying to get as close as you can to the right values. You can see that when I photograph it, it usually photographs a little bit darker. Um, it's hard to kind of hard to read here, but uh, it's brighter on the screen than it is in real life. So, you, you know, you want to take that into account when you're when you're making these corrections. Like the light on her um, shirt is really bouncing out too much. Her eyebrows are crazy. So you put those eyebrows in, then you have to really wiggle them in while they're still wet. Let's have a look at it in grayscale now and see how I'm doing with values. So still, this is way too light. It's jumping out above everything else, and it looks... It's just flat. It's just coming forward, and it really shouldn't. Eyebrows are bad. The mom doesn't look too bad. She's, she's on her way. You can see my angle here for the highlight on her hair is off. Um, baby's looking okay. Once I get these things softened and this shadow under her nose softened in a bit, she's going to be okay. At first, her head looked huge, but now looking at it, grayscale it doesn't look as huge. Um, these legs definitely need a lot of work. They're very flat. This foot has gotten a little small, so I've got to put the, add the toes on there. Looks like three feet here. So I definitely need to fix those shapes. There's a lot to be done, but looking at it side by side in grayscale like this will help me go back and soften some things, tone some things down, because the whole canvas is covered now, and that's really my goal for this first stage. So I'm going to leave both of these up so that you can see how I make my corrections. I'm going to leave it in grayscale as I make these corrections and I'm going to use um, a softening brush to uh, knock down some of these edges with. Depending on the size of your canvas, these are three little cheap watercolor brushes that come in that little set of 25 that you can buy at the hobby store or Big Lots or um, most anywhere. They're really soft. And I'm probably going to use this middle one. Um, I also have one that's a little bit larger. So you can see all these ranges of soft mops. These work best for me. I also have the mongoose brushes. Um, if I use a mongoose, I will make sure that it's completely dry and doesn't have any paint in it because you notice how it gets a little bit stiffer when it's wet. It has a sharper point on it, and I'd rather have a softer point like this when it's when I'm going to use it for softening. So, But this is one of the... Um, Synthetic ones, it's a little bit harder than the real mongoose, and it has some dry paint in it, it feels like, or some brush cleaner in it, so we'll see. We'll see which one of these work, but I'm just going to now spend a little bit of time <clears throat> knocking these edges down, particularly the things that bother me the most right now, which are the, the eyebrows, and I'm thinking about the direction these eyebrows go as I knock them down. Um, once you get the color out of the way, it's a little bit easier to see shapes and values. So that's a helpful tool, again, by using the, the grayscale. All right, her, this shadow under her nose is off as well. So let me go ahead and I'll use a, one of my smaller ones for that because it's such a tiny area here. Once your paint's wet, if you need to use a mall stick so you don't lay in it, just be sure to do that. If you have a steady hand, then just keep kind of going forward with the steady hand to just soften some things out. Really, I don't mind if it's a blur today. I really feel better when I go in the second time if I've made a place for everything and just kind of soften things down. This is a little too harsh. And I want to pay attention to the angle here of her neck. The baby's not really smiling. Um, this baby has a little bit more of a happy expression, so I may fudge on it a little bit and make it a happier baby. I don't know. We'll see. This 
eyebrow definitely goes up higher. She has a little bit of a surprise look. I keep a paper towel in my hand and I do have a small wooden dowel that I use sometimes for as a mall stick. Uh, these tiny features um, are tricky so you want to make sure that you soften these things before they dry. It's a little bit easier when you go back into work next time if things are soft and dry. I keep a paper towel in my hand. I'm constantly wiping off these little blending brushes as I, as I soften things out. All right, the next big thing other than the brows was this, um, this light tone right here. So I'm lifting a little bit of that off to knock down the value of it. And I want to knock the edge off of it, especially here. So it's not sticking out so much. It's there and it's shaped like that. It's just not such a sharp line. And this is a good way to, to look at your brushwork and see um, oil painting brushes, paint leaves sharp edges. So your job is to check and see what needs softening. If you're working in pastels, then everything is pretty much soft. So you don't have to work quite as hard. You just automatically have soft edges. All right, that's feeling a bit better. This warm tone goes down this way a bit more. So even if it's blurred right now, that's better than having really sharp edges jumping out everywhere. Again, I, um, I hope you'll stop and get up, get away from your, your painting pretty often. That's really key. Uh, you just have no idea that you've lost your, your objectivity as you sit there and sit there and sit there. So do that often. There is creative flow where you really get going and you, you don't want to stop. And I understand that. I do it all the time, all the time. All right, what else? Oh, the feet were really bothering me. So I'm going to get the larger. Actually, I'm going to use the mongoose brush down here because this can stand a little more aggressive um, diddling here. And I'm not too worried about this being exactly right right now. I just want to make sure that it's believable. So sometimes I'll put the brush strokes in this way and then I'll affect them this way to give that cylinder uh, feel. The outlining that I did early on with the uh, darks is um, too strong in places, so it needs to be that needs to be cleaned up. Remember the little foot, bottom of the foot has a hourglass shape. So it's easy to put this in and make it all really way too straight. Be, be careful with that. Back to the mongoose, brushing it every few minutes. I mean, I'm wiping it every few minutes. And let that just melt right there. That doesn't have to be standing out so strong. I don't think I have that knee up enough. This was the other another shape that was really bothering me. It looked like another foot right here. So you notice that this is all very light. I may grab a little bit of that light blue again because I have it too dark. Just kind of lighten up in here a little. There. That crazy shape is now gone. Take the heel off here as well. Much better. So here again, even in the um, block in, there are things you can do to uh, make lots of little corrections in the block in. Everything is way too sharp and harsh, so everything needs to be toned down. This here is way too dark under her chin. That should be light. 
Let me see if I can deposit a little bit more of this light blue color. You can see that in the value scale. Look how dark that is. So I got up in her face and that's okay. I can fix it. The sleeve just kind of melts here. All right, let's move over here. Look how dark I have this. So that also needs, I've got two mongoose brushes here, one to soften with and one to add uh, a little bit of light tone right here. I'll go a little bit lighter than I meant to because I'm painting wet and wet, so it will just eat it up. Okay, let's see what else is jumping out. Um, this is, I fixed this a bit. Let me soften this hand in. Um, just, it's really melty along this edge here. Fingers just melt. You don't really see any tips to those fingers. You can push and pull your paint around more now at this stage when it's wet you know take advantage of this time that while everything's still wet if you're working in acrylic you're going to have to work in in smaller sections and stop frequently to check an area uh, get used to taking you can put that app on your phone and take pictures and put them side by side if you want to it's a, it's very helpful to do that everybody seems kind of resistant to doing that but the side by sides just fool your brain and they help you look at it as if it were a brand new image. So, so take advantage of that tool. All right, the last little thing that's really jumping out at me, I didn't do anything to her face, but I'm gonna soften a little bit around the perimeter of her hair. It's kind of nice when you have a mother and a child to um, to have them melt into one another at some point to where you don't, you see, you really don't see where the baby and the mother. So right here it melts, right here it melts. Um, the hand melts down here, but their figures are kind of joined together here and here and here. And that's, that's a good thing because, you know, babies are sort of connected to our hip until they're about three. They really are continually making the, the journey to become separate beings. They were in our wombs for nine months, and so they stay on our hips and around our ankles, and I'm having that again with helping raise my two-year-old granddaughter. So she's a part of me most of the time. She wants to be held. So it's good to think about those things when you're painting because um, your, your, your storytelling here, it's important that you get that right. So... Let you tell more of the story, I guess, with your with your paint. So this is softer here. I have that a um, little bit blotchy there. Her brows, still not right. Those brows can really make a scowl or an angry look. So try to be mindful of those as you're working on these two faces. You're not going to be doing a lot of detail on the faces. I mean, on the features, so you might as well make sure that the brows and the angles on the eyes are right. Wipe often with these little blending brushes. This light is too strong here, but I can move it around a little bit. That's right, that's the front plane. These are the side planes. Don't have a break between the nostrils here, so I can use this little tiny brush to do that. Still too, it's gotten too dark under her nose. So let me use this little brush to try to put that back in. Tip of the nose, full turn. I 
The mom's a little easier just because her face is a little bigger. And there's a time to come back in here and pop that light back in. But right now, because it's going to dry before I get a chance to work on it again, I want to soften everything together. There's a little reflected light under her chin right there. I can get that later, but I'll put myself a little reminder there. That's too light, but it's there.